10 knots. An RAF Hawk leaps from the runway on an extraordinary mission to show you a sight that's never been seen, to answer a question that's never been asked. This island of ours, curvaceous and smooth to the east, jagged and irregular to the north and west, flat along the bottom. Why on earth is Britain such a peculiar shape? To find out, the RAF is going to fly us all the way round the shores of England, Scotland and Wales in half an hour flat, an apparent speed of Mark 10, five times the speed of Concorde. People who live by the coast will talk us round every twist and turn. Where do we start? Over to our pilot, squadron leader Ray Philthorpe. Just coming up to Land's End. Land wouldn't end here at all would end way up at Bodmin if it weren't for this enormous lump of granite growing like a girt parsnip from miles down in the Earth's crust. Granite's hard and very resistant. Good job we've got our toughest defenses facing this continuous bombardment from the Atlantic. Just behind in the softer rocks, all Mount's Bay has been washed away by the ocean. St. Michael's Mount? Comes the lizard. And we're back into your horn blends and ultra basic rocks. Again, very hard, very stable. Just the foundation you need for your precision telecommunication satellite tracking aerials at Goonilly that relay our TV programs right around the world. Are you telling me you originally made the Earth? Did you ever go to a place, I think it was called Norway? No, no, I didn't. Pity. That was one of mine. Won an award, you know. Lovely, crinkly edges. Aficionados of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy know already that Slarty Bartfast designed the coast of Norway. Or as you might guess from its peculiar shape, Britain was designed by a committee with names like Pliocene and Pleistocene, glaciation and tectonics, operating on materials like gneiss and undifferentiated tough. But don't panic. <laughs> There's no panic. I'm sure you're gonna explain all of that, but I've got a race against time. First, we'll accelerate to Mark 10. You're not going to be able to stand the journey at this speed for very long. So I'll sidle off down here and keep the round Britain with going. We'll flash up place names as we pass them, and a satellite picture will appear now and again to show you how far we've got. And while all that's going on... We can find out why Britain's such a peculiar shape by looking for more clues along the coast. Plymouth. No more big towns until Torquay. Let's fly ahead to Lime Bay. Well, no architect who valued his job would have designed it like this. Porous chalk and sand on top of waterproof clay after centuries of rainfall, water seeps out over the clay. And what happened? Ah, Christmas Eve, 1839. Coast Guard at Roseden rushes to the window of his clifftop cottage. There's a wondrous crack. 500 acres of good farming land, including the Coast Guard's cottage, slide majestically down onto the shore. A thousand years and the weather will have washed all that shattered land into the sea leaving a new line of cliffs. Golden Cap, highest cliff on the south coast, and here comes Chesil Beach. A unique bank of pebbles, 50 foot high in places, stretching 20 miles from Burton Bradstock to Portland Bill, all given back by the sea. As you come down to Portland Bill, the drifting currents get stronger, able to move heavier rocks. So the sea's graded the pebbles from pea size at one end to fist size at the other. Drop a local fisherman, blindfold, anywhere on Chesil Beach, 
he'll be able to pick up a pebble and tell you exactly where he is. Well, so they say. Needles coming up ahead. So this must be the Solent. A river valley 10,000 years ago, when the Solent River flowed along here. Then, from the last ice age, the ice melted. And it raised the seas, and the sea came in, and all the river valleys down here were drowned. And this little southern bit of land got cut off. And that's how the Isle of Wight was made. Now we're beginning to see the edge of the South Downs. Chalk, a pure white graveyard for billions and billions of tiny organisms. Coccoliths like these that once swarmed in tropical seas. One by one, the microscopic creatures came to the end of their lives and their chalky shells sank to the bottom. How many died to form these towering cliffs? The number must have been absolutely astronomical. And at Beachy Head, the cliffs soar to over 600 feet. Which raises a question. How did the ancient seafloor rise so high? Well, look at the cliffs. 25 million years ago, continental drift pushed up the Alps in Switzerland and crumpled this part of the land too, forcing the north and south downs sky high. So far, we've been flying along the folds of rock. But once round Beachy, the different layers meet the sea end on. Like a saw cutting across the grain, the teeth of the elements can now get a bite. Eastbourne's fighting to keep its beaches. The lover's seat of Fairlight had disappeared over the edge. Land had been deposited at Dungeness for a landslip at Folkestone Warren. And now we are back to the chalk again, the famous White Cliffs of Dover. All this rock folding has given a beautiful, sinuous shape to Sussex and Kent. What a contrast with that ragged, untidy coastline across the Thames. You'd look a bit ragged if you'd been through what we've been through. No offence, my dear. Well, be reasonable. Continental drift may have buckled up the north and south downs, but it ducked Essex underwater. North Sea deposited clay all over the county. Then the Ice Age pushed all the rivers south, and old Father Thames couldn't make his mind up where to go. First, he thought he'd sneak out along the Blackwater estuary. And in all that dithering, the river dropped gravel everywhere. Gravel and clay. Sea does what it likes with it. If it weren't for all our sea walls, we'd never have kept our heads above water. Sorry. Clacton. Here comes Walton on the Naze. Tight turn here, and heading straight for Harwich and Felixstowe. Orford Nez, the mouth of the river has been pushed south 18 miles by all the stones washed by the sea from places like Dunwich, further up the coast. Dunwich? Oh, dear, oh dear. In the 12th century, we had 13 churches here, two monasteries and half the population of London. We returned two members to Parliament till 1832. Now the sea swallowed the lot. The last church disappeared over the edge in 1919. And they do say, on a stormy night, you can hear the bells clanging away out under the sea. Up here in Norfolk, you're getting a different effect of the ice age. Last ice sheet bulldozed from Norway right across the seabed. Now, when the ice melted, that left all the muck along the coast, what they call boulder clay. On the Norfolk coast, the clay's sitting on chalk, but the chalk's on the huh, as we say, on the sloop, just like the rim of a saucer. And just here, soft knocked a hully grit chip out on it. Low tide and there ain't a sign of chalk. That's all sand. Gat sand, thief sand, bulldog sand, Pandora sand. And the sand I'm marooned on, oh, it's much more like mud, actually, is called stubborn sand. But what's happened to the chalk? Well, you've got to realise that geology isn't an exact science like all, say, physics or mathematics, so we're really getting. But look, 
there's Lincolnshire and the top of Norfolk and the great saucer of chalk. Now, when the Ice Ages have pushed the rivers southward, many rivers may have flown out through here and then swept it all away, leaving it with the wash. On the other hand, something may have just made the chalk sag away. We're not quite sure. But what we are sure about is that everything behind the chalk, Britain's second line of defence, as it were, is softest of soft clay. So when the ice sheets of the last ice age melted, making the sea rise 300 feet, there was water across to Peterborough and right down to Cambridge. All of Fenland was underwater, and the Isle of Ely was indeed an island. And that solves the problem of King John losing his baggage in the wash. You see, today there's no place in the wash that you could cross it by horseback. But back in the days of good King John, well, of course, the wash went much further inland than it does today. Now the fence have been drained and the land reclaimed. If we were Dutch, the whole wash would be growing tulips by now. And what are we doing with it? Well, look! What do you think those are? Weapons range. Danger areas. I ask you. Lincolnshire. And the whole course on the move for the next hundred miles. Shoreline used to be back here on the raised edge of the chalk walls. And the Humber was a short, stubby river. But the melting ice sheets left all this clay behind and the Humber had twice as far to go. You can see the king halfway up the history, and on the river mouth's top lip, Spurn head, like a long piece of cigarette ash dangling down over the mouth of the river. Where'd it come from? From Hotton, Northorpe, Dunlington, Monkwick, and a score of other villages on this 30 mile stretch that have disappeared into the sea and the sea's carving up to 10 feet a year back into the defenceless clay. Look, it isn't until nearly up to Flamborough Head that the chalk sweeps up and rescues this part of the Yorkshire coast from oblivion. Think I need to put a spurt on now. Crikey! Wishing up this coast is just like flying back through the ages. From Tor Bay, right round Flamborough, we've been looking at rocks that are young in geological time. Now, we're beginning to see much older rocks, right hard, prominent headlands. How did these hard rocks get here? Well, we're coming to that. But, by heck, we're going much too fast. Yes, sorry about that, but there's a long way to go to Land's End. Incidentally, you'll notice the lower I fly, the faster we seem to go. I'm about a thousand feet up now, but sometimes the RAF flies down to 250 feet. People on the ground might find it noisy, but we must gain experience with low flying to avoid radar detection in time of war. Edinburgh already? Just show you the fourth bridges to prove it. Hold tight, I'm coming over. Back up the Fife Coast. It's time now we told you how the Round Britain Woods has been organised. I'm flying a hawk out of RAF Valley in Anglesey. Kind of aircraft the Red Arrows fly. Underneath, the BBC's mounted a metal box with a video camera inside. Now that's really a hostile environment down there, slammed by all the wind and bang up against a powerful jet engine. The camera points backwards. Why backwards? Well, ever driven down the motorway with a nice clean windscreen? Anything over 70 and the bugs don't get collected, they splash onto the... Not so much got to where I'm going as to think where I've just been. So if I lose the coast from time to time, forgive me. It's not that easy. We're rocketing ahead towards Aberdeen. Granite land. We keep talking about all these ancient rocks. How did they get here? Well, you have to understand, we live in a piece of the Earth's crust that's had an immensely long and eventful history. Go back 3,000 million years, and Britain was on a planet that hadn't cooled down, a seething mass of volcanoes. Since then, layer upon layer of different rocks have been laid down in this volcanic foundation in a long succession of environments. 
370 million years ago, Britain was near the equator and looked like this. This was the period that formed the flagstones of Caithness. 40 million years later, a warm, shallow sea rippled across the land and the oozy bottom became great swathes of limestone. 280 million years ago, Britain became largely desert and the sand became the rocks of a red sandstone cliff. Duncansby Head and John O'Groats. 160 million years ago, in the age of dinosaurs, the area that's now the North Sea subsided, and Britain became an area of forested swamps and warm seas. 60 million years ago, huge new volcanoes lifted the entire land to the northwest, where the Scottish Isles now are. Meanwhile, the North Sea continued to sag. So the country tilted down to the southeast like a seesaw. Britain as a whole drifted north. And the first ice age began, grinding down the land as ice sheets over a mile thick bore southwards. Cape Roth, turning south and heading straight into sun. Up here in the northwest of Scotland, the ice has scraped off all the top layers of rock and the ancient basement rocks are seen the light of day again after countless millions of years. As you might expect, they're in a poor state of repair. The whole land is cracked and crazed and complicated. The biggest cracks right here where the northern land mass has actually slid against the south. Did it go that way or that way? Geologists are still arguing about it. What's certain is that this ancient part of Britain shows the deep-lying scars of our planet's turbulent adolescence. Yes, but just look at those mountains. The Coolins. No prizes for guessing where we are now. Just look at the Isle of Mull, worn down stump of a huge volcano. When it went off, it split the land like a bullet through glass right down as far as Newcastle. And the ocean's taken advantage of all these cracks and faults and weaknesses and carved them out to form the rugged sporran of the Western Isles and Lochs. miles an hour, very difficult indeed to fly around without losing the picture you want. Hang on a minute. If the coast of Britain's 4,000 miles around and he's going at 400 miles an hour, how does he hope to do the round trip in half an hour? And he's shooting backwards, he says, but we are apparently flying forwards. Anybody tell me what's going on? That's all right. QED is using the very latest tape machines that will run backwards or forwards. But you're right. It's taken a lot of sorting out. And it's okay to speed up the tape. But look what happens when I have to bank to get round the sharp end of the Solway Firth and down towards Cumbria. The Lake District's a 450 million year old dome of layers of rock. But in the centre, the top layers have been ground off by the ice to expose the mountains. St. Bee's Head, coming up to Sellafield. Round the coast, you can still see those top layers. They're coal and sandstone. And quite honestly, they're not worth looking at. Coming up to Walney Island. Morkham Bay, dead ahead. Morkham Bay, cemetery for lost causes. The latest idea was to dam some of it off and use it as a freshwater reservoir, but it all fell through. 
what would the Dutch have done? Here comes Blackpool Tower. I have to be careful now and check my clearances. It's a mistake to think you can fly all around Britain just like that. Not only do I have to climb to 2,000 feet to avoid bird sanctuaries and nuclear power stations, but each of these areas needs special permission to fly through. Either the army's shooting targets and their shells was out to sea, or it's guided missiles. I don't want one of those on my tail. Don't miss the Mersey. <laughs> I've got other things on my mind. Yes, but the Mersey's narrow mouth at Bootle speeds up the ebb tide and the river current, so it clears out all the silt. Result, a deep channel to take ships up to Liverpool. But here comes the D. Mouth wide open, the current hardly moves. So over the last few centuries, the D's all silted up. Chester may have been a thriving port in medieval times, but no decent sized ship can get into Chester now. Been fairly lucky with the weather up to now. Not quite so good ahead, though. Colwyn Bay, Little Orm, avoiding the Great Orm and heading for the Menai Straits. Two river valleys that don't quite meet. Formed in the Ice Age, flooded when the sea level rose, and just like the Isle of Wight, Anglesey became an island. Four hundred and fifty million years ago, the volcanic rocks that were to form Wales were folded to produce giant mountains. The north and south coasts still follow the direction of this ancient structural grain. And even though ice sheets, a mile and a half thick, have ground them down, the hard old bones of the land keep poking through to form these resistant headlands. Another tight corner as we swing round Bardsey Sound, Bardsey Island, and trying not to tear an expensive RAF hawk apart back towards Hell's Mouth. Puelli. Puelli. Now, in between the north and south coasts, the land has sunk, and the flooded river valleys are a playground for the boating fraternity. And we swing round into Cardigan Bay. And in the middle of the bay, something rather interesting. the familiar hymn tune, Aberystwyth. And just north of this charming university town is a strange coastal feature. Well, I'm standing on one end of it now. It's a causeway, or sarn, one of several in the area. And it runs straight out to sea for seven miles. Where does it lead to? It leads to the lost land of Cantor Gwylot. A legend describes Cantor Gwylot as a kingdom defended from the ocean by sea walls and flood gates. What happened to it? Well, the ancient Black Book of Carmarthen suggests that Saithenim, keeper of the flood gates, was bewitched by the lovely Meredrid and the sea flooded the land. Other legends blame strange little people who lived in overflowing lakes. But who were they? The legends give us a clue. Plowing the green sward where they grazed their herds drove them hopping mad. And your only defense against them was iron. Now, geologists claim that these sounds are natural features. Let them claim. My Celtic blood tells me that such legends are founded on fact. Well, let's go back to the Stone Age. Stone Age men often lived in pile dwellings. Huts perched on poles in the water. A pasture-loving people, born herdsmen. But 
lacking the technology to till the land with an iron plough. What well, small wonder that they hated the coming of the Age of Iron. Is it possible, then, that these legends of ours go back 6,000 years to a time when the coastal Stone Age people came into contact with Iron Age cultures? A time when much of Cardigan Bay was still dry land. One thing is certain, Cantor Gwaelod is lost forever. Perhaps because Mererid seduced Sithenin, or perhaps because the melting ice age made the timeless sea engulf the land. What do you think? Pembroke. Well, we say it's the most beautiful stretch of coast anywhere in Britain. The ocean has carved St. Bride's Bay out of the softer rocks between the hard shoulders on either side, just like Mount Bay in Cornwall. But unlike Mount Bay, these hard rocks haven't been injected upwards from deep inside the earth. They follow the folds of the deep foundations of the land, a directional sweep followed by all the coastal hills of South Wales. Sands and across to the Gower. Incidentally, I don't know how far up the Bristol Channel they want me to go. There's only a few minutes to the end of the programme, and I've got to get right down to Land's End. Let's hurtle past Swansea and Cardiff and find the Severn Bridge. There it is, coming up now. <laughs> Back past Avonmouth towards Western Supermare. Bristol Channel wasn't carved by the Severn, you know. River's far too small. In fact, the Severn used to flow north and came out at Merseyside. Then, like a lot of other rivers, it was pushed south by the Ice Age. And fortunately, it found an ideal estuary already made by the ancient geological sweep of the land. Porlock Hill, Linton and Lynmouth. These bend proper cliffs at all, you. Them the foothills of Exmoor that just happen to be dangling their toes in the water. Coast hasn't really settled down yet, so the rivers haven't quite decided how to get down to sea level. Remember what happened to Lynmouth when the River Lynn suddenly changed its course straight through the middle of the town? Oh, for good. And there's a sharp turn coming up. I don't think we're going to make Land's End by the end of the programme. I don't know if you've noticed it, but the north coast from here to Land's End goes down in a series of steps, just like a staircase. That's because the rocks underneath are cracked like that. Clavelli, Heartland Point, another sharp turn. Pugh's got an interesting rock platform. Goes out half a mile to see it, low tide. Cut when the sea level was much higher. Look, we've really got to step on it now, or we're not going to make it in time. Roll the credits. Staggering contortions in the rocks around here. Tintagel. Mark 10. Mark 11. Mark 12. Here comes the dives. Blink and you'll miss it. Land's end ahead. Back where we started. That, I think, completes our round Britain whiz.